So I will talk about um, uh, scattering ampl amplitudes and, and two aspects of scattering amplitudes in D dimensions. Um, and <clears> the <throat> first, first topic is uh, supergravity UV properties. Um, and the second topic is, is something called uh, color kinematic duality. And so this is um, work in collaboration with Sveburn, Lance Dixon, John Joseph Krask, and Red Roybon. Um, so let me start with some motivation. Um, so it's, it's, it's approximately 35 years after the birth of supergravity by Sergio and, and, and collaborators. Um, and, 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 and one can say that the detailed knowledge um, of a potential uh, D equals four UV divergences are actually within reach um, now. And maybe that's a bit strange to some people here, uh, but it's actually a, a matter of fact that uh, um, there are actually no uh, four dimensional divergences known for pure supergravity to this date. Um, and you might wonder why, and you think about it, and it's actually because um, Supersymmetry forbids uh, the easy calculations at one and two loops. Um, um, well, there are counter terms <laughs> which you can imagine being there at one loop and two loop, and these are R squared and R cubed, but these are incompatible with SUSY. Well, the first one even vanished on shell by the uh, ghost Bonnet theorem in four dimensions. Um, however, if you go to less supersymmetric theories, um, uh, there is uh, this famous calculation by Gaurav and Saniati. Um, where they show that um, two loop uh, pure Einstein gravity is divergent. Um, and at one loop, there's no divergence for the same reason that this one is zero on shell. <clears throat> okay, so um, what I'm interested in is maybe not so much finding the divergences, but finding the absence of divergences. Um, and in particular, then we want to look at theories which are very uh, nice, known to be very nice, so very well behaved, and that's um, n equals to supergravity, which is the unique, unique theory with maximum number of, of supersymmetries. Um, so this is potential candidate for UV finite quantum field theory, at least perturbatively. Um, um, okay, so it's known, um, just in the last few years is known that there's um, at least no divergence before seven loops. Um, I will come back more uh, about the details here and, and get back to the references. Um, unfortunately, um, we don't have the power to do a seven loop calculation today, uh, but we do have a power to do a five loop calculation. Um, and this actually probes the same divergence, uh, sorry, the same counter term, but in a different dimension, uh, which is this strange fractional dimension, 24 fifth. Um, you can work out that the dimension of an operator in this dimension at five, five loops is actually the same dimension as seven loops in four dimensions. And it's basically the same uh, structure of the counter term. And it's known, um, it's known um, uh, that there is a strong connection between um, the different uh, counter term in various dimensions in this maximally supersymmetric theory. Um, so that's something that actually is an uh, ongoing calculation. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it here because it's not done yet. Um, so I don't have the result, uh, but I hope um, in the near future to have the result. <clears throat> so in the meanwhile, um, let's think about um, why this is interesting. Um, so um, let's, say, let's say that it happens so that at each order in perturbation theory, uh, you get the finite result. Um, why would that be interesting? Um, I mean, there's many reasons why n equals eight is not an interesting theory, um, you know, because well, because it could, it's not chiral, um, it's, too, it's too unique, perhaps it, it's, um, um, well, it might not be perturbatively, sorry, uh, yeah, non-perturbatively complete and so on. Um, so then, um, what if you have this result, um, why is this interesting, if, this, if it would be so? Um, and, well, I think it's fair to say that if it's finite, it better be finite for a good reason. I mean, it's just not accidentally finite um, order by order, uh, where naively you would expect it to get worse and worse. Um, so, so the hope is that if there is some structure, it, it might be some, something like a new symmetry, for example, or something like that. Or it could be some other mechanism, uh, and, and, and one could say that if you could understand this mechanism, this might open a host of new possibilities, maybe finding other theories which or more interesting for phenomenology. Um, 
Um, well, this might be a cheap talk, perhaps, uh, but um, the question is, have we, find, have we found something that actually supports that there are new structures, new hidden structures? Um, and yeah, and we found this actually very interesting property as we were doing um, our multi-loop calculation. We found that gravity is a double copy of gauge series, order by order in perturbation theory. And you might recognize this because, of course, if you, if you, if you know your string theory, this is, of course, well known uh, relation between open and closed string, uh, known as the quiet level and tie relation. But what we found was something even more interesting, and, and that's that the gauge theories themselves behave as Lie algebras. Um, they satisfy the same relation as the gauge group Lie algebras. But this is not, not uh, the, the gauge group part of the theory, but the kinematical part of the theory. So that's why we, 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 we call this the kinematical, let's call it kinematical duality. Um, and this is not the duality between two different theories or two different physical regions. It's just uh, a duality between two ingredients in gauge theory and gravity. Um, okay, so uh, let me get to the outline. So the first half of the talk will be a review of the ultraviolet st statues. Um, I will briefly flash the the new five loop uh, super Yang Mills amplitude, which we have calculated this July. And this is a stepping stone to N equals eight, and that's why it's important. And then I will get to this uh, duality in column kinematics and how that still leads to a double copy structure of gravity. Um, and at the end of the talk, I will show a number of loop amplitudes which has a manifest duality. And this is because uh, the duality is conjectured at loop level. So um, we're just looking for evidence that um, you can actually uh, make it uh, manifest, and, and so we're just looking order by order. Um, and, and this is actually quite interesting. We're finding lots of new interesting uh, amplitudes, and, and we can analyze the ultraviolet behavior and so on, and we find something you can call our symmetry violating amplitudes, which uh, I will get to at the end of the talk. Okay, so let's review the ultraviolet properties. So um, in a Four dimensions to start off with. Uh, so, so as I said, N equals eight is a supersymmetric theory. So conventional superspace power counting for bits one and two loop divergences. Uh, I think this was first uh, pointed out by Greensworth, Spring, Hausdell, and Marcus Sainz-Sognotti. Um, but um, going from two to three loops, it's not entirely clear what happened, at least not six years ago. Um, there was some argument why there shouldn't be a divergence, mainly from string theory, and there was I mean, some argument that said, well, there might be a divergence. Uh, so, um, so we, we did, um, um, we did, a, right, we, we did uh, what we could to figure out what was going on and to put a, um, a definite answer to this question. So we did a calculation and we found that there's no divergence. Um, uh, of course, this is what we expected, but what we found is that it was much more finite than one uh, could naively expect. Um, uh, so we found that the divergence does not happen in four, four dimensions, and not in five dimensions, but in six dimensions. So that's quite far away from four dimensions. Um, we also did a for loop calculation, um, but uh, if the for loop calculation doesn't yield, uh, there, was never, there was never a question of whether you could give a consistent counter term. Um, so that's why uh, that wasn't in interesting for that reason. It was interesting for getting the d-dimensional uh, divergence in higher dimensions. But anyhow, so, so the last two years has been um, a large amount of work from different people trying to figure out what's going on in this theory. Um, and using more sophisticated an analysis, using E77 symmetry, uh, using advanced uh, supersymmetric method, and using string theory in more detail, um, uh, all these people figured out that, well, you, you, you can definitely cannot have a divergence before seven loops. And at seven loops, there is a unique uh, candidate for the counter term, and this candidate is uh, one eighth BFS, I believe. Um, and then starting at eight loops, there's, um, there's a number of, of possibilities, uh, but the seven loops is the unique one. Um, okay, what about higher dimensions? Um, so higher dimension is interesting because the behavior of higher dimensional uh, supergravity predicts the behavior of lower dimensional supergravity. Um, so here, mainly things have been progressing by explicit calculations. So going back to, uh, I think, the 80s, um, when the two-loop calculation was done by Marcus Sagnotti, then also Bernd Dixon, Dunbar, Perlson, and Rosowski in the 90s, 
and then um, recently by our collaboration um, up to three, sorry, up to four loops for um, your supergravity and up to five loops uh, for N equals four super young mills. So here I'm comparing both N equals eight supergravity and N equals four super young mills. And the reason is because they, they conform to the same pattern. They obey the same formula. This is the dimension where the theory diverges and this is the loop order. Um, and it's, it's so far is valid, um, uh, well it's valid for L larger than one. one at one loop there's something special happen, happening because there's, well one way of seeing it is there's an infinite number of ghosts in the loop in, in various formulations, but um, for higher than one loop this formula is the same and even at one loop the divergences are the same, but it's not 10, it's eight dimensions. Okay, um, so uh, here's a graph basically saying the same thing. Um, so here I plotted two graphs, uh, sorry, two, two curves. Well, first of all, I have the axis, which is the number of space-time space dimensions and the number of loops. And then I just plot two graphs, which uh, basically should be a theory which is, um, as, uh, which, is, um, um, which is renormalizable in four dimensions and a theory which is uh, renormalizable or finite in two dimensions. Uh, so naively, you would expect that this is the behavior of the yang mills theory and this is the naive behavior of a gravity theory, right? But then you see the, the data point so far is that uh, both theories, both N equals 8 super Young Mills and N equals, uh, sorry, N equals 8 super gravity and N equals 4 super Young Mills line up on this curve. So they both behave as they were um, a gauge theory. They both approach um, a four dimensional bound. Of course, we only checked it up to four loops so far. Um, so there's an explicit calculation. Uh, this data point, so a, a five loop has done been done for Young Mills and it's there. And of course it, it's also known, there's, an, there's a proof uh, by Howe and Stell which says that this is, actually, this is a bound for Young Mills. It, it can't be, the divergence cannot be below. Perhaps it can be above, but it cannot be below. Um, so uh, this curve I drew such that it crosses right through the for loop calculation because that's the last data point we have where we know that the two theories have the same power counting. And if you do that and, and you draw it um, such that it's asymptotically equal to two, then it actually crosses the four dimensional line at the unique location and this is seven loops. And this is all consistent with uh, the, the, the prediction that uh, L equals seven is the lowest loop order for a possible four dimensional divergence. Uh, so basically all this gray area, we know that there is no divergence um, and then the first point is seven loops. Now um, here's, okay, okay, so then, um, okay, so what, why is five loops interesting? Well, it's because five loops will tell us uh, where things are heading. Uh, will it continue on this line here which, um, which supports finiteness or will it head in a, in a direction which do not support finiteness? Um, so, uh, I mean, these numbers are strange uh, and uh, they might not mean anything to you, but I think this, this plot shows you very clearly that, that um, the five loop calculation will tell you what, what is gonna happen um, at seven loops. Um, here's the thing, same thing said in terms of uh, counter terms. So there's this behavior that um, the loop amplitudes can be expressed in terms of some derivatives and then um, uh, the Riemann tensor to the fourth power and then times some integrals. And of course, when you compute the UV divergence, you get that the counter term is of the same form. And the pattern we observed is basically that you get two more powers for each loop order. And that this is why uh, N equals eight behaves so good because it gets more and more momentum powers on the outside. And this, these guys can't contribute to a divergence. Uh, but then if you're a um, pessimist, then you say, well, at some point this will stop. Um, at some point you will reach a limit where you won't pull out more momentum powers. So if you think that at, starts at four loops, then you say five loops is gonna be the same. And then you can work out that that will mean that there is a 24 fifth uh, dimensional divergence. Now on the other hand, if you're optimist, you say, well, this pattern probably continues. Then you get 10 powers of R of D here. And then you get the 26 fifth. Uh, so that's another way to look at it. And then if you get this answer, then, um, uh, then you know that at starting at five loops, you will have at least 10, deriv 10 derivatives on the outside, and that implies no divergence before 
uh, L equals eight loops. Okay, uh, here's a kind of crowded table um, with various prediction, and I, I won't really have time to go through it. I can say that recently everything has been converging here, but there are some older statements which are mostly outdated. Uh, let, let, let me just go that, through that, skip it. So um, here's, here's the um, uh, five loop uh, amplitude for n equals four super young mills uh, that we finished in July this year. Um, so originally we're trying to do it in a slick way, um, uh, but uh, it turns out that we had some technical problems and then we did it in a more hairy way. Um, and we did it more in a brute force way and um, well, we, we wrote down all the integrals and, and we fixed the numerators. So there's 416 integral topologies in this representation. We use a method which we call maximal cut method, which we worked out in 2008. Um, and um, basically what it says is that we're looking at the, we're looking at the integrand of the amplitude and we're looking at, the, at the, singular, the, the singularity where all the propagators go on shell. Um, and this is what we call the maximal cut. And then, and then you're, you're uh, uh, um, step by step reduce the number of propagators that go in shell. So here you have the maximum number minus one propagators going on shell, and here's the maximum number minus two, and so on. Uh, and this gives you, an, you, this will give you an algorithm how to correct the integrand. Um, in fact, so because n equals four has very nice UV behavior, uh, it turns out that this is the last cut you have to do of this class, uh, what we call the next to next to next to maximal cut, or the n cubed maximal cut. Um, so this cut um, is only involving uh, taking products of three point on shell amplitudes, four point on shell amplitudes, five point, and then a six point as well. That's, that's the third possibility. Um, so that's, that's a really simple, uh, uh, simple calculation. Each calculation is extremely simple. Uh, on the other hand, we have to do a lot of them. So that's why this is a hairy calculation. Um, okay, so we, we did the whole thing. We integrated it in the, in the critical UV divergence dimension, which is 26 fifth. And here's the answer. Um, first, we got the whole uh, bunch of, of, of different integral topologies. We got the hundreds of them. But then using integration by parts identities, we can reduce um, all the divergence down to this vacuum integrals, vacuum-like integrals. Um, basically, what you do is you take the integrals, you set uh, the external momentum to be soft, and that means that the internal momentum, the loop momentum, is hard, which is the UV limit. And then, um, after cleaning, uh, after massaging it using integration by partial entities, uh, which is not that hard, um, then you get this, um, this very simple form, which only has three different integrals. Um, and note that the divergence is proportional to um, a single trace. So the double trace is actually finite. Uh, so this, this two different, this, this three structures here are zero. And furthermore, the single trace, which is proportional to one color, uh, one power of NC, number of colors, this is, this is SUN, um, this also vanish. Um, so remarkably, only the, the planar part, the leading color, and the next to leading color uh, contributes to the UV divergence in this dimension. Um, and it hasn't, it hasn't been understood why it's like that. Uh, there are some arguments why these guys uh, don't show up, um, and these are post extensions from string theory, but uh, nothing has been said about why this one cancels. This was already observed at four loops uh, three years ago. Okay, um, oh, I should say one more thing. So you might wonder why it's this combination of integrals and that's something I also wonder, but, but at least I see a pattern here. Um, and that's the, the pattern is that, um, well, if you, if you know about Casimir's in, in, uh, which shows up by five loops, uh, the quadratic, sorry, quartic Casimir, these are exactly these diagrams which co contribute to the quartic Casimir. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the, the, the quartic Casimir showing up at four loops. And if you just cut this diagram here, you would get the four loop propagator diagram. And that's, these are the three uh, quartic Casimirs. Uh, well, th this, these are the, the integrals, the diagrams, which as a linear combination will form um, uh, the quartic Casimir uh, in, of the gauge group. And that's, it's really interesting why a UV divergence want to be expressed in the same integrals. Um, well, 
Well, that brings me to the next topic, which is that color and kinematics are actually related somehow. And this is what we call the color and kinematics duality. So, um, so uh, the way we would like to say it nowadays, I think, is that yang mill theories are controlled by some sort of kinematical Lie algebra. Um, and the best way to expose this um, uh, algebra is to represent the amplitude in terms of cubic graphs. Um, because if you look at the color structures, they're all cubic. F, FABC is a cubic uh, color structure. Um, so th the way we write it is that we work, in, first of all, in any dimension um, and any loop here. Um, and then we write uh, the diagram, the Feynman diagram, as a number of, a number of propagators in the, in the denominator. We write, the color factor is just given by contracting FABCs. And then there's a numerator factor. This numerator factor is a little bit hard to get a handle on because it's basically what, the, what uh, it encodes all the information from the theory. It encodes the momentum, the states, and so on. And it's basically what you usually uh, do when you compute a Feynman diagram. This is, this is the object you want to have. Um, but OK, what we observe is that you can always find a representation of this form which uh, obey this relation. Um, so if you, took, if you take each four-point sub-diagram in this larger Feynman diagram, or I shouldn't call it Feynman diagram because there's no Feynman rules which actually produce it yet, but if you take this representation and then you look at each four-point sub-diagram and if you enforce this relation uh, <coughs> and this relation, which is just anti-symmetry, you, you notice that you get something very interesting. Um, you, will, you will actually get that the kinematical diagram behave as if we're part of a Lie algebra. And, and that's why we call it the color kinematics. Um, let me go a little bit into detail, but not too much. So first of all, you might wonder, well, does that work? That seems pretty strange. Uh, well, you can go home and check it at four point using just Feynman rules. Let's take this one for example. So two quarks, two gluons. Uh, compute the Feynman, Feynman rules for this one, this one, and this one and then check that there's a linear relation between this on shell. Um, well, I won't show it here because you have to plug in what this is, but you can, this is pretty simple calculation. And then you notice, well, that's exactly the same relation as, uh, as the FABCs uh, contracted with the generators satisfy. So this is a manifestation of how uh, gluons are dual to uh, FAB, FABC structure or a joint color and quarks are uh, a dual to this uh, fundamental color. Uh, but if you're working in uh, N equals 4, for example, then uh, you always have uh, a, a joint uh, 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 fermion, so that it, it works the same. It works as well. So, so here's some points or subtleties or whatever you call it. Um, so first of all, you know in, in Yang Mills there's a four-point vertex, and I just talked about cubic graphs so far, so what, what happened? Well, the, the quartic vertex you have to absorb somehow into cubic graphs. It has to be there, but it has to be absorbed, so you don't see it. It's, and one way is just do it by hand. Whenever you have a four-point vertex, just resolve it in terms of a propagator and then a num numerator. And that's really just one, but at least it gives you a propagator and it gives you some kinematical dependence on the numerator. And other more, maybe a more elegant way of doing it is to introduce an auxiliary field, which combines two A's into one B, and then you let that also actually, you let that propagate. And, and th this has been done um, in the literature. Uh, I, should, I should say this has been done by Byrne, uh, Byrne, uh, Yutin, uh, Wang, Kiermaier, and um, uh, Denon. Um, I should say that, so I, I said here you can just use four, you can just use Feynman diagrams, but it's important that you have the legs on shell. Um, as you go to higher than four point, the duality is not manifest. If you pick your favorite Feynman uh, rules, it won't work. Um, unless you have some very special Feynman rules. Uh, so what it means is that you have to reorganize the Lagrangian to see it. And that might, that might, you might get suspicious by that. Um, but at least we know actually that it works at three level because uh, there is an all N example. This was written down by Kiermaier, Bjorn Bohr uh, et, et al. Um, where they actually they inferred what this um, three level amplitude was using actually uh, quite level and entire relations. Um, but at least an example of something that satisfies all the, all the algebra constraints. 
And moreover, um, even though that the numerators are actually gauge dependent, you know, each Feynman diagram is, is not gauge invariant. So, so this numerator is not gauge invariant. But nonetheless, all these Jacob relations, when you combine them for the full amplitude, it enforces gauge invariant relations on partial amplitudes. And in fact, it takes you down to n minus 3 factorial basis, which is a number which you probably recognize, right? It's the number of um, uh, vertices which you integrate over in string theory. And in fact, after we wrote down these relations, it was shown that string theory also contains uh, the same or very similar relations um, uh, at the tree level. And this, these are called the monotony relations. So that's a deep connection to um, string theory. And I won't have time at all to review um, there's, there's some interesting work done by Steberger and company where they, where they, can, where they did, um, well, three level to all multiplicity uh, using these relations and so on. Um, okay, so here's, an, here's a very curious example. So, um, so originally when we wrote down the conjecture, we were talking about uh, young mill series and, and two, two algebras, Lie algebras, right? But, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, here. Um, let me start over again. Uh, so, so here's why it's, this is interesting. Because, well, this is, might not be so impressive. You're just org reorganizing the Yang Mills theory. But here is, is where it gets interesting. So once you have reorganized your Yang Mills theory such that, um, well, first of all, the color factors satisfy the Jacobi relations, but the numerator factors also satisfy their own Jacobi relations, then it's a small step to get gravity. All you do is you just replace C by N. Uh, it's remarkable that this works, but it works almost too good because you can do it in very many, many different ways. Uh, so this is why I call this n twiddle, and this is n because the numerators need not be the same. They could be in different theories. So this could be n equals four super Yang Mills, and this could be n equals two super Yang Mills, and you get n, n equals six super gravity, and so on. You can get n equals four super gravity, and this has been used recently to show that. Um, there's absence of, of, of n equals 4 supergravity divergences as tree loops. This was used exactly like this. Um, uh, you can also get Einstein gravity, but if you just do it naively, you notice that you have two states here, you have two states here in four dimensions, and then of course you get four states on this side, and that's Einstein gravity plus axion and dilaton. Um, and in principle, you could, you could um, uh, project, this, project this out just to get pure Einstein gravity. Um, uh, but we haven't worked in this, uh, in this theory very much, so that's for the future. Uh, okay, so now, now, okay, now I was mentioning, um, so, uh, so originally we were, we were, our conjecture was for um, young mills theories and for two algebras, Lie algebras, but um, these guys here, Bagirhi and McLaughlin, they noticed that, well, if you, if you look at this more exotic theory, BLG, which is built out of three algebras, the same thing works. Um, so um, the Gates group now is not the Lie algebra, it's a tree algebra, and it satisfies this fundamental identity, which involves uh, four diagrams at six points. Um, and if you enforce that the kinematical numerators obey the same relation as the, as the color factors, um, you get the consistent uh, a reorganization of the amplitude. You get amplitude relations between different partial amplitudes. And moreover, if you square the four point and the six point amplitudes, diagram by diagram, um, you get, uh, you get a E8 uh, n equals 16 supergravity of Marcus and Schwartz. Um, well, you might wonder what theory this is. Well, this is the same as n equals 8 supergravity in four dimensions, just dimensionally reduced. Um, so this is this remarkable statement fact here that um, BLG is, you know, somehow the square root of n equals 16 supergravity. Uh, well, this is not a very precise statement, but at the particular case of four points, this is very precise. Uh, you just take the four point amplitude, which is this form. You take the square root, and when you take the square root of this Grassmann object here, which is just the supermentum, then you have to, of course, just divide it in two parts. But otherwise, this is the this is the BLG amplitude at four points. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, so, um, so I said that this is, this is somehow a kinematical Lie algebra. And, and I, perhaps I don't have that too much evidence of that. But I do have one evidence, because Montiero and O'Connell gave us this evidence. Thank you. 
Um, so um, they were looking at self-dual um, Yang Mills in light cone gauge, and they noticed that um, well, uh, self-dual Yang Mills doesn't contain any quartic interaction; it only contains cubic interactions. So they noticed, well, so this better be a good candidate for a theory which has manifest um, color kinematics duality. So you better be able to write down um, uh, algebra, um, a kinematic Lie algebra. So they did that, and it has this very simple expression. This is just some derivatives. This is just a light cone direction. I think it's actually a space cone direction, so, but, but never mind. It's, um, this is what it is. And here's the commutator. Uh, you just compute, uh, sorry, you, you commute uh, two Ls, and you get a, an L back, which has momentum, P1 plus P2, which is very nice. Of course, if you act on this, you should get the sum of the momentum. And you get this coefficient here, and this coefficient here is, of course, nothing but the structure constant. Uh, if this was a ordinarily algebra, which it is. Um, but moreover, this is also the Young Mills vertex. So in fact, the, the commutation relation between these generators generates the interaction of the theory. Now, this this um, this theory is um, I mean, it's not the most complicated theory. Uh, it only gives you all you know plus helicity amplitudes, um, which on shell at tree level happens to be zero. But um, at one loop, there is actually a non-trivial S matrix. Uh, but at higher loops, there's no, there's no S matrix. Um, so this is, this is a very interesting first attempt to write down what this algebra could be. Uh, but of course, we need to find algebra beyond that. Uh, in fact, what Montiero and O'Connell did is actually the, they also managed to get this to work for MHV amplitudes, where you have two minus uh, helicities. Uh, but then they did it in a, um, in a way where they, uh, they shows a particular um, uh, light cone gauge such that it, you, you can kill the, the four point vertex which appears in amplitudes. And then, um, so then you get, you get the asymmetric uh, Lagrangian. It, it doesn't have the crossing symmetry, but it worked. So, so that's an example where it was generalized beyond that. But, but this, this one is, is more clear, clear to understand. Okay, so now uh, the very last part of my talk is I'm going to show you a number of amplitude um, which has the duality, and this is going to provide some evidence why this holds. Um, probably not going to have time to review all of them. Um, so first of all, uh, let me just plot which ones have been done. So these are the ones we have been done at tree level. Um, this is n equals 4 to being mills and n equals 6 supergravity. So basically at, at tree level it has been done to all multiplicity just because there is this all n representation of numerators via, via KLT, written on the Kiermaier, Bjorn Bohr, Damgård, Sandegard, and Van uh, But more interesting is the loop level amplitudes. Um, so we've we done explicit calculations, um, well, three loops and four loops, a uh, four point, and five point, uh, one, two, three loops. Um, and we were, as I said, we were working on five loops, and I also working on six loops, but never mind that. Um, um, so all of, all of these green things have been done here. Um, and I, c I can show you some of the uh, uh, results uh, in, a, in a second. But you can also do it to pure QCD, uh, Einstein gravity. Uh, but then, then, then um, since these amplitudes are much more complicated, you have to find a simple subsector. And this is the all plus helicity. So this is the all plus helicity, uh, the yellow ones here. And of course, tree level is the same. Um, because n equals a, sorry, any, the, 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 the non supersymmetric theory is just a subsector of supersymmetric one at tree level. So that's why this is the same. But there are some examples here where all plus helicity has been done. Um, so here's, here's the most simple example. So if you just look at n equals 4, one loop, four point, then this amplitude was written down in 1982 by Green, Schwartz, and Brink. And they show that it's a simple scalar box integral times a kinematical prefactor. And now the special thing about this prefactor is that this is actually totally symmetric when you interchange the legs. And this is not apparent from the way it's written, but it's true. Um, and now, if you know something about how uh, color factors work at loop level, you know that the Jacob relations tells you to anti-symmetrize the legs, and that will give you a triangle diagram. So it's the same thing for the kinematical. You just try to anti-symmetrize this diagram. Well, you just, you just work on the numerator, right? Because the numerator will satisfy the relation. Since this is totally symmetric, you, you, get, you get zero when you, when you antisymmetry straight. So what this is saying is that there's no triangles, which is true. There is no triangles in this amplitude. And further on, there's no bubbles. There's no tadpoles. 
So just that simple exercise shows you that this is actually satisfy all the Jacob relations. So in fact, if you square this one, you, should, you better get n equals eight supergravity, and that's true uh, because that's that's the that's the amplitude that Green, Swartz, and Brink also wrote down in 1982. That the, the square of this prefactor is just n equals eight supergravity amplitude. Uh, the same thing can be done for the all plus helicity QCD amplitude. It's, it's quite similar, except that in this case, uh, the, the prefactor here actually depends on the loop momentum. Mu here is a loop momentum which points in the in the in, in the space which is orthogonal to the external momentum. Um, but this object is also totally symmetric, even though this doesn't look so. But it is a totally symmetric object. So when you when you anti-commute uh, the legs, anti-symmetrize the legs, you get zero. And again, there's no triangles, and that's a known fact. Um, so I, I should say this amplitude was computed by, by Byrne and Kosovo in the 90s. Um, okay, so, um, so now let's get to a bit more complicated example. So here's uh, one loop five point. So this was done just last year. Um, so here, um, so you, you write down all the cubic diagrams, basically. That's the recipe. But then n equals four has a special property. It's that it doesn't have triangles and bubbles. Um, and, um, and so there's only two candidate diagrams to write the amplitude in terms. And, this is, and then you can just figure out what the numerator factors are and they take these special forms. And these are, these are, really, these are spinner products. And this is, this is the Levi-Civita tensor contracted with four momenta. Um, so this gives the right amplitude. Um, this is just a symmetric delta function. And you can check that if you anti-symmetrize beta here, you will get gamma. If you anti-symmetrize one and two, you will get gamma, one, two. If you further anti-symmetrize three and four here, you will get zero because it's totally symmetric. So uh, that shows that uh, this representation satisfies uh, color kinematics. And in fact, when you square this, you will get n equals supergravity, which we verified by doing unitarity cuts. Uh, and the same thing can be done for the all pasilist amplitude. It's actually closely related. All you do is just replace um, delta eight Q with mu to the four, where mu to the four is again the loop momentum uh, orthogonal to the External momentum. Okay, so um, so uh, here's two loops. Um, so this was also done in 1998. So all of this, this amplitudes were written down in a form which satisfied the Jacob relations before they knew that the Jacob relations existed. And that's that's because the numerator is pretty simple. It's just s, the Manasami variant, times this same factor as at one loop. So you can also verify that if you anti-commute one and two, you get zero because S is totally symmetric, for example. Um, if you anti-commute two and three, you get something non-zero, but that's a, this is this diagram, basically. Um, uh, here's the old plus QCD amplitude. This, this one is, is given by four different diagrams, and it has a much more complicated structure, but we showed in 2008, actually, that um, this one can also be written in a form which satisfy uh, the duality. Okay, let me move a little faster. So here's a more non-trivial example, and this is three loops. Um, so this was in 2010, uh, where we uh, wrote down this representation in terms of 10, sorry, 12 diagrams. These guys have loop momentum, because tau here is actually external momentum dotted into loop momentum. Um, and it, it's, it's a non-trivial way the loop momentum enters. Um, and this, this representation satisfies all the occurb relation on all the possible sub-diagrams that you can think of. Uh, in fact, you can, you can do an estimate on how many Jacobi relations are, and it's, it's roughly speaking uh, the number of internal propagators times the number of diagrams, and it's actually 12 diagrams times 10 propagators, so that's 120 Jacobi relations, and all of this numerator satisfies, sorry, this numerator satisfies all those relations. Um, okay, let me skip this, because I think, yeah, I only have five minutes. Um, so now, let's talk about GV divergences. Now, before I just show the integrand, and Integrand is not so interesting, you might think. But let's talk about something which is, is, is valid after integration, and that's the UV divergence. <coughs> so, um, so here's, 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 the, well, here's the five point amplitude again. Uh, what you do is, um, well, first of all, you determine which dimension it should diverge. And at four point, is known that it's eight dimension. And it's the same, actually, at, at five point. So you just integrate the, this amplitude in this um, eight dimension internal momenta. Um, and then you will know that, well, this integral is actually finite just by simple power counting, and this one is divergent. So only this one gets contributions. 
And the divergence looks like this for Young Mills. Uh, looks a bit complicated, but you can actually rewrite it in a much nicer way. And uh, it's unfortunate that I didn't do that. Um, but then here's the, Young, here's the supergravity amplitude. Um, and you note that it's more or less the square of what appears here. So you're squaring the numerator, and then you, you, you're not squaring the, the propagator. The propagator is this leg here. Um, and in fact, this counter term can actually be rewritten on a form which actually satisfy color kinematics duality, but with a four-point vertex where you have contracted this loop to a point. Um, and, and then uh, the color structure is uh, D, A, B, C, D, uh, a four-point color structure. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, that the, uh, the counter term of this divergence also satisfy color kinematics duality. So even the renormalized theory satisfies it. Um, earlier in my talk, I mentioned this SU8 violating amplitude. Um, it's nothing strange. You're in eight dimensions. So there's no reason why SU8 shouldn't be violated, because eight-dimensional supergravity doesn't have SU8 invariance. Uh, but nonetheless, you can separate the amplitude into terms which, which obey SU8 and terms which violate SU8. And they look like this. And uh, this is basically a supersymmetric delta function. And I don't have time to explain what the notation means. But you can see that this expression is local. This is non-local. This means that this is actually a divergence which has appeared already at four points, whereas this divergence only appeared at five points. So this counter term must be a four point four field uh, operator, and this must be a five field operator. So the natural um, candidates are this guys. Uh, you can see that this, 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 this object actually contains uh, states which correspond to a single scalar and then four gravitons. Um, so that's what I call the SU8 violating amplitudes because this operator violates SU8. Um, Okay, uh, the same thing happens at two loops. I won't go into the details. It's pretty much the same. Um, and then uh, let me stop briefly at four loops. Uh, so four loop calculation finished. Well, this, this particular calculation we finished in January. Um, and this was basically reorganizing the four loop calculation because we, we, did, the, we did the four loop calculation in, in, a, in a way which uh, which didn't expose the duality between color and kinematics, so then we had to redo it. And, and then we got it to work, and basically here's just two examples, here's two diagrams, and you can see that n equals eight supergravity is just the square of the n equals four subbiang mills. And in total there's 85 diagrams, which has manifest duality. And power counting, both n equals four and n equals eight is manifestly finite in 11 half dimensions, sorry, below 11 half dimensions. Um, so it diverge, both diverges actually in 11, 11 halves. And the divergence is given by these two expressions. And I have encircled this object here because you might notice that it's the same. Uh, so in fact, the same, diver same combination of integrals, I, I haven't drawn what the integrals are, I should have done that, but the same combination of integrals appear in n equals eight and n equals four, sorry, n equals four and n equals eight. And you can, you can actually say that um, um, uh, uh, this, this object here is actually the leading color. So there's no reason why that should match um, with gravity, because gravity has nothing to do with planar amplitudes. But this is the subleading color, and they match. And that's quite remarkable. And in fact, um, you might remember this special combination of integrals. It's the same combination which appeared at five loops, um, except it's different integrals, but they basically just take your four loop integrals and you, and you sort them together and you get the five loop diagram. Uh, so that's quite remarkable that we find this, we have this very simple structure here at four loops and we find almost identical structure at five loops. And I think that bodes well for the five loop uh, n equals eight supergravity calculation. Okay, so uh, now this is my last slide. Um, so concluding, so, so I showed you that we had done explicit calculations in n equals eight supergravity up to four loops. And this shows that uh, um, power counting exactly follows that of n equals four subyang mills, which is a finite theory, of course. Uh, and then there's this arguments, E7, supersymmetry, and string theory insights, which have shown that there can't be a divergence before seven loops. So even though we can't do the seven loop, we can do a five loop in 24 sixth dimension. And this will probe exactly the same counter term as the seven loop divergence. So it will provide critical in input to the n equals eight question. 
Um, and then I show you this nice structure, which appears to be very generic, that um, this color kinematic reality allows us to take gravity calculations, to ob obtain gravity calculations simply by reorganizing the Yamil's amplitude and then squaring it. And this even works for BLG, as was shown by um, uh, McLaughlin and collaborators. Um, so, uh, but so far there's no representation of the, co uh, the kinematic algebra except for this simple case of the self-dual sector. So, so, um, so you have to do more work to actually understand what goes on in Young Mills theory. Uh, but nonetheless, even though we don't have this representation, we can construct representation um, case by case, uh, lo uh, loop by loop, leg by leg, uh, and then the double copy formula then gives us gravity integrands for free. Uh, and this greatly facilitates the UV analysis, which is what I showed you on the last few slides. Um, so this is what we're currently doing for our five loop calculation. So uh, just stay tuned and I hope we'll have the result soon. Thank you. And it goes for, uh, I'm not involved in that calculation, so uh, maybe we'll have heard more, more about uh, this from uh, Guillaume Abassard. Um, um, so what I, what I know from rumor is that uh, they're calculating for loops to check whether there's a divergence of for loops, and then they're using, they're using this representation because they can just take this Young Mills copy, and then they can just take FAMA diagrams from pure QCD and then it will get n equals four uh, supergravity. So that's what they're doing. But since they're using Feynman diagrams, you know, things is kind of slow. Four loops Feynman diagrams is not the most efficient way, but that's, well, it is the efficient way, most efficient way given that what, what we have, but ideally you would make, you know. Say what? What's the reason? Oh, um, well, maybe that's something that Borsard will tell us uh, or someone else. Or maybe Renata, maybe? Yeah, Renata will tell us. Um, um, well, it could be finite. I don't know. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the reason is. Um, um, it could be, well, it could be that um, this, if you believe that there is some connection between gauge theory and gravity um, um, for n equals 8, then you say, well, maybe that extends down to n equals 4 just because the double copy for n equals four is just a simple product. You don't have to project out the extra scalar states. Um, but yeah, it, that's just speculation, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Is there a systematic of when you have to do that? Um, um, well, I think that's, um, I mean, that's something we're still trying to figure out at five loops, but, um, but so far we noticed, um, I mean, so far the rule has been that um, as long as you're not creating triangle diagrams, you're allowed to pull out legs. So, so, so this diagram was originally, at, well, these legs were originally attached here, and then you would ha actually had a, a pentagon sub-diagram. Um, but then you can pull this off and you get still a box. But if you get a triangle, um, then you, you can use the no triangle property of n, n equals eight supergravity or n equals four super mills to say that, well, that diagram you probably don't need. Uh, but that's not a guarantee. Um, we, don't, we don't have a systematic uh, understanding of it. Uh, it's Do I understand that those are actually the dominant diagrams? Yes, so uh, for, for the gauge theory, for the gauge theory side, the gauge theory, this, this is a scalar diagram, actually, and <clears throat> since it has much fewer internal propagators than this diagram, it has one fewer, right? It has more external propagators than it has, must have fewer internal propagators. That's why it's more leading in the UV than this guy, even though this guy has loop momentum. Uh, but for, for the gravity, when you take the double copy, then all diagrams have more or less the same um, behavior. They're all leading. There are no further questions. Thank you again. Thank you. I have to make